In a recently published and widely reported study, Agile development has a 268% higher failure rate than the alternatives. Now, I'm a believer in the fundamentals of Agile development, if not some of the more common Agile theatre that is probably more common than genuine agility, to be honest. But even so, these claims seem extravagant and wrong. So let's take a look. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content here today, hit like as well. In this episode, I want to look at this so-called research into the development practice and explore a little about what this really is, because it isn't scientific research, and how we can spot the signs of nonsense like this, and also how and perhaps why we as an industry, or at least the tech media, seem to have reacted to it as it has. This study that makes the 268% claim has been very widely reported, mostly because of its sensationalist and extravagant claims. What this looks like to me, though, is a clear attempt to promote a new book, which was published on June the 4th. All this noise in other media started the same day or the day after, so it was clearly a coordinated exercise. This is clickbait marketing for a book. And so I'm not very keen on advertising this very much further, but feel that there are a few problems here that are worth us discussing and highlighting. I'd like to do what I can to rebut some of the nonsense in this report too. I hope demonstrate some more effective critical thinking along the way. This all appears to be part of a concerted campaign, as I said. Two weeks before the publication of the book, the author went on online and started editing references to agile practice to promote his upcoming book, including submitting changes to the Wikipedia entry for the Dora research, in which he attempts to belittle it and promote his own. The disinformation marketing campaign, at least within the confines of the software development community, has gone pretty much viral which has been amplified by a lot of uncritical reporting on the so-called findings. This despite the many warning signs that this clickbait and disinformation contains, but more of that later. This campaign is aimed at selling copies of an otherwise unnoteworthy book, which I suppose is fine at some level, but doing so with poor pseudoscience and by compromising other people's much stronger, better researched work seems at least disingenuous to me. The main headline of the report is this. A study consisting of 600 UK and US software engineers finds projects adopting agile manifesto practices are 268% more likely to fail than those which do the opposite. Just that statement raises quite a lot of scepticism in me, and, in me and sets off some alarm bells. But there's also quite a lot more. But let's start here. By last year, the State of DevOps report had accrued over 36,000 submissions collected over a period of nine years. They used widely regarded peer-reviewed approaches to collecting and analysing the data including how the survey was structured, how the questions were asked, some fairly detailed cohort analysis of the people submitting their answers, and a professional statistical approach to interpreting the findings. If you're more interested in understanding the science behind all of that study in more detail, you can read the Accelerate book and check out my recent conversation with Nicole Forsgren, one of the authors of that book and lead researcher that began the study. This compared to the 60 times fewer surveys collected over the three days based on what looks to me like a set of questions designed to elicit a specific designed response. We'll look into that in more detail later. Once again, marketing, not science. Let me pause there and say thank you to our sponsors. We are fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Transfic and Semaphore. All of these companies offer products and services that are very well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering in general, click on the links in the description below to check them out and their services. So the other cause for my skepticism from that initial statement is, what does the opposite of the Agile Manifesto mean? There are four principles from the Agile Manifesto. Here they are. 
individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. So presumably, the opposite is this. And that doesn't sound better to me. We've tried that and lots of studies and our practical experience for 30 or 40 years demonstrated that it didn't work. Now let's be clear here. There is a problem with agile development because the straw man argument that the commercial versions of agile practice are bureaucratic and heavyweight has some merit. Agile, by virtue of its commercialization and adoption as the norm for big, fundamentally unagile organizations in the form of practices like SAFE and the common adoptions of pseudo scrum, has become the opposite of what the Agile Manifesto defines as agile. It's more about process ceremony than individuals and interactions, more about following a plan than responding to change. And so is, in the Agile Manifesto terms, anti-agile rather than agile. But that isn't the fault of agile development as an approach. That is the result of a failure to adopt the fundamentals of agile practice and the subversion of agile as a marketing term, I suppose. Now, seemingly, as far as I can tell, this chap is recommending going the whole hog and adding comprehensive documentation over working software and following a plan over responding to change. Good luck with that. I talk about real agility in lots of my videos, but this one is probably worth checking out as it also points out why the impact engineering that this chap is promoting in his book is the wrong direction, despite the FUD spread by the author. Software development is never a cookie cutter operation. And if it was, we'd be making a big mistake by embarking on it in the first place, because software development is always by definition really, about discovering and creating something new. Because if we're not creating something new, then we're being stupid by treating this as software development. Because in software, we can perfectly recreate whatever we already have for essentially zero cost. So why on earth would we spend time and money doing it again when we can recreate it for free? Let's look at this so-called research, because it looks very suspect indeed to me. In the table of results in the report, the first practice deemed to increase the chances of success is the project requirements were clear before the software development process began. And this resulted apparently in a 97% better chance of success. Although it doesn't actually define what it means by success. However, it does say this earlier in the report, with 65% of projects adopting agile practices failing to be delivered on time it's time to question Agile's cult following. So perhaps we can assume that the author's main criteria for success is on-time delivery. Now, I'd say that's nowhere near enough to determine success. Delivering something on time that's useless and inappropriate for our users isn't success. In comparison, the report also says this, the project requirements were accurately based on the real world problem. That improves the chances of success by 54% apparently. So according to this research, that's saying that knowing the requirements before we start the project, even if they're wrong, is a greater predictor of success than if the requirements are accurate based on the real world problem. What utter nonsense. It's true that there are some types of software where the project requirements can be well and clearly understood before you begin. I spent some time writing device drivers in the early in my career. So the requirements were really pretty specific. Translate this well-defined input into this well-defined output. But these are really corner cases and a vanishingly small proportion of what professional software developers usually do. The illusion that users know what they want, that product owners know what the users want, or that analysts can break down work and make it as precisely defined as a device driver is simply a fantasy. Software is much more difficult and much more complex than that. Assuming perfect requirements is naive nonsense. Not just for software, but for any form of engineering, really. Engineering is always a creative evolutionary process of discovery and learning. 
The first aeroplanes were death traps that flew slower than modern cars. The first iPhone had no GPS, no camera, no app store, no apps, and certainly no new shiny AI features. So why and how is being able to predict precisely what you aim to build important for a process of iteration and exploration? Of course it would be nice if we could perfectly predict the future and get it exactly right first time. But this is the real world, where creating new things, whatever they are, simply doesn't work like that. Why is it that businesses and naive technologists, like the author of this book, always value predictability quite so highly? When a new business starts out, they tend to talk in terms of the runway that they have as a metaphor for how startup finance works. By this, they mean the amount of money that they are willing to invest to get to the point where things take off and they start to make enough money to pay their costs and begin to repay the investment that they've made and presumably also make some profit. They then make an informed guess about when they'll run out of money. They define a limit beyond which their seed money won't stretch, the end of the runway. So there are two parts to this guess. The first is based on how much money we start with and the rate at which we spend it. And then, even more difficult to predict, when will we sell enough stuff to be profitable? The first part is a lot easier to predict than coming up with a guess of how much effort is involved in building software, but it's analogous. For the second part of the problem, which we could characterise as if we build it, will they come, we can't ever be sure that our business ideas will resonate with our potential customers until we try. We can't ever be sure our software features will be useful to our users until we try either. These are complex problems, but sensible people in business and in software know that there are ways to cope. We can decide to invest heavily to get things going quickly and monitor what's going on, tracking how close the end of the runway or how fast the end of the runway is approaching, and how well our sales and so our investment is playing out. Then we can make decisions and course corrections as we learn more. For example, we could decide to ration our activities, make progress more slowly and more cheaply. Perhaps with fewer people and less grand offices and cheaper biscuits with our coffee. We can decide to go back to investors and ask for more money to lengthen the runway. Or we could decide to cut our losses and stop because our ideas didn't seem to be working out. All of these options have downsides, but they're all valid because they recognise the fact that we can't perfectly know the truth of what our customers or users really want, or predict the future with enough accuracy to form detailed, correct plans that we can execute on perfectly. Software is no less difficult to predict than business success. In fact, in some ways it's more difficult, and in others they're the same thing anyway. So why do businesses so often seem to recognise that it's sensible to adopt a trial and error based approach, recognising that business is a complex adaptive system, while assuming that perfect predictability in the complex adaptive system of software development is what we should be striving for? This seems like irrational nonsense to me. I'm sure that it would be nice for my grandkids if we had fairies at the bottom of the garden, or they'd love it. But that's no less likely than that we can perfectly predict all of the work necessary to achieve something complicated, except for the most trivial of outcomes, and then execute on that plan so perfectly with no missteps at all, so that we hit some arbitrary goal that we imagined was a good idea when we started out, and didn't yet understand the problem fully. I don't intend to go into lots more detail of dismantling the ridiculous claims of this report and presumably the book it's trying to sell. But I do have a couple more things to say. First, a cursory look at the so-called engineering practices that form the basis of this report, which read to me as a clear example of the kind of questions designed to elicit a predefined answer. It looks to me as though the author starts out with an assumption of an extravagant claim that he'd like to make, and then structures the questions to back up that extravagant claim. This is not a reputable academic approach, and claiming that it is is misleading. Of course everyone's going to agree that if we could have all of the requirements perfectly understood, software development would be easy. But it's such an overly simplistic view of software development that it completely misses the fundamentals of what it is that our discipline is all about. 
Exploring to find the requirements is a deeply important part of the software development process. It's not separate from it. Software development is not just about typing code. It's about designing systems that we can iterate over and change as we learn more, as well as writing code, as well as finding requirements and analyzing them. I'm kind of surprised that this person didn't also recommend that we should all learn to type faster too and invest in crystal balls to perfectly predict consumer need, or maybe we should ask the fairies. This report is not just naive and built on the wrong foundations though. It's extremely poor work. It's internally inconsistent and exhibits jumbled thinking and massively over-exaggerated claims. For example, it says that when significant changes were made to the requirements late in the development process, it predicts a 7% increase in the chances of success of the project. My bet, given the rest of this nonsense, is that the author meant the reverse. But this is supposed to be findings from scientific research, so accuracy is kind of important. On the extravagant claim of the 268% failure rate of agile practices, the author claims a p-value, that is a probability that this finding is in error, of 3.8 times 10 to the minus five. That is only 3.8 in 100,000 chance of being wrong. This from a poorly constructed survey of 600 people. My last question is why on earth has this been so widely and so uncritically reported in the technology press? Well, the first hint is just how similar the reports are to one another. This was a press release and the articles are basically copies of that press release or of each other and so are just lazy clickbait journalism. This all seems to me clearly a marketing exercise to promote what looks like a pretty poor book and it has seemingly worked because here we are talking about it. This is sensationalist drivel that doesn't seem to stand up to any critical analysis at all. So no, agile development has not been shown to be 268% worse than impact engineering. But yes, the software development press is susceptible to reporting utter nonsense, verbatim sometimes. Thank you for watching. And thanks to all our Patreon members for supporting the channel. It's through your efforts that we're able to continue doing this. Thank you very much indeed. And if you'd like to support us to do more of this kind of thing, do consider joining and getting many of the benefits of, of Patreon membership. There's links to that in the description below. Thank you.